what do you want to know about extracellular matrix? What is an extracellular matrix and how does it work? So, in human bodies, not only human body, uh, cells are living in environment, extracellular matrix. It contains long leaf proteins, it contains uh, pteroglycans and a bunch of other molecules. And uh, if, we are to, if we are talking about how it works, the major player, I think, in interaction, cells or cell interaction, is uh, long leaf pr proteins, collagens, especially collagens. How it works uh, in terms of aging, I think, right? The question should be more specific. Yes, how does it work in reference to, to aging? Collagen, you see, there's a few things. First of all, collagen turnover in different tissue has different rates. If you're talking about skin, it might take up to 15 years so for half-life of collagen molecules. In cartilage, according to some studies, up to 100 years. In lungs, on the other hand, on lungs, it's uh, about 10% of collagen, 10 to 15% of collagen. Uh, Per day, we have turnover rate a day. So different tissue, different collagen turnover. However, long leaf molecules, protein molecules, are prone to be modified all the time. There's two main processes happening. It's one of them, it's uh, three-dimensional structural changes, racemization, like when amino acid residuals, they change from like mirror-like position. Uh, this process is called maximization and it's uh, actually it's used by uh, forensic studies in forensic studies to determine the predict age of uh, remains. Like if you're, if you're taking two for bones, you can estimate the age of uh, remains. It's one of the process. Uh, definitely structural changes affect protein functions and might affect uh, progression on a number of diseases, including HSSID diseases. And second process, it's uh, protein glycation, which happens when two molecules, two molecules, they become interlinked with sugar, and this, it's called cross-linking. So this cross-linking, there's two types of cross-linking. One of them, enzymatic, which is controlled by body, which we have a feedback loop, and we're able to break, break down and form a new cross-link, let's say intentionally. And another process which happens uh, all the time, uh, but without enzymes, non-enzymatic. So this is more serious process. It's happening only because we actually have some sugars, like glucose, in our system. It has some concentration and uh, under some certain conditions can be catalyzed, for example, in pro-inflammatory pro environment, this cross-linking might be more, more severe. And definitely diabetic per, per people, sugar level is higher, and this cross-linking process, uh, 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 non-enzymatic glucosination, are happening more... Um, progress more. Uh, what happening during this process? So cross link proteins are changing the structural and uh, mechanical properties. If you're talking about mechanical properties, it's rigidity. They become more rigid, more hard. And structural properties, they, um, they, I'm talking about nanotopography. Uh, it's not in my poster, actually. It's a poster of uh, Alexander Fedensov, but here he is trying to put together some ideas about how cross-linking affects longevity. So, as I said, through glycation, there are different processes of cross-linking. They are non-enzymatic. They depend on temperature or concentration of uh, ingredients and uh, maybe some other parameters. But the, the main key, they, are not, they don't have feedback loop. They are not controlled by uh, our biochemistry. The same process, by the way, happening in when you're making a cookie, the Meyer reaction, browning. So this process, cross-link proteins, and leads to few outcomes. One of them, it mimics wounds. So mimics, not wounds, it mimics um, fibrosis. So cross-link proteins are not fibrotic tissue. They're just mechanically modified proteins. However, cells are receiving from mechanical receptors for uh, cytoskeleton, receiving signals and they assume cells, again, to some extent you can say assumes, uh, it's fibrosis and trying to break down these cross-link collagen molecules by releasing metalloproteases. 
And unfortunately, metalloproteases are blindly trying to break down other molecules, all collagens, not only affected by cross-linking. So, and it's, this process leads to uh, trigger some reaction and leads to uh, release of CCN1. It's a, one of the biomarker for senescence. So, and it, uh, let me let me figure out like, biomarkers of senescence. What will be the next step? So in, in this case, we can see the, how mechanical changes, mechanical changes in extracellular matrix might trigger senescence through, for example, CC, CCN1 or, or transformation growth factor beta 1, that's in our uh, senescence, senescence biomarkers. And there is another process happening at the same moment. More rigid extracellular matrix, more rigid extracellular uh, pores in extracellular matrix, pores become more rigid and more stiff. In this case, during the migration, macrophages, immune cells, during the migrations, they can penetrate easily through rigid pores. However, nucleus, then our DNA stays prone to be ruptured. And this micro rupture not only affects um, expression of some genes, because G, um, DNA and proteins inside our nucleus, not just floating, as it, like some chaotically floating, they're strapped to the inner surface and to the inner surface of nuclear membrane. But during the migration, nuclear membrane prone to be ruptured. It affects gene expression and also some mitochondria, which are supposed to be in intracellular environment, they might be locked inside nucleus and remains there. In this case, Reactive oxygen species, which we, as we know, uh, leak out from mitochondria, we might directly affect DNA and damage it. So it was uh, Alex's idea. He was presenting it here. Uh, he's presenting it here during the event in Berlin on doing aging. So all these processes taken together are uh, affecting phenotype of cells and longevity. Why it's badly overlooked areas? I, I know it's one of, one of the questions you want to ask me. Uh, maybe, maybe because it's difficult to study actually it changes to the extra metrics. Think about model animals, typical model animals, mice. How long it live? Like two years. During these two years, we cannot observe much changes in extracellular metrics in long in short lived animals. We need to adapt long lived animals but it will increase cost of research, time waiting for results. So it's one of the reasons maybe it's not very popular. And other things, as I know, uh, artificial extracellular metrics, which uh, like f can be used for culturing, are not the same as in, it's in vitro studies, are not the same like in vivo. We, we, cannot, we might see completely different results from the similar settings. Difficult to measure components, difficult to analyze components of extracellular metrics. For example, different types of modification, modified proteins. At this moment, we know more than 20 types of modification. The most abundant type of cross links are glucosepan. Aubrey like, usually is mentioned about this. Uh, David Spiegel is working and last year on this particular type of cross link. His team last year was able to synthesize glucosepan. Right now, we're able to at least synthesize it in the laboratory, and uh, it might lead to some good findings, because once you're able to synthesize, you can conduct research and so on. But what we can do with other, I don't know, 19 or 99 types of cross-links, so they're still uh, undefined, we're still, uh, still waiting for a time. Difficulties to model, difficulties to uh, analyze, because mass, mass spectrometry is Relatively expensive process. Uh, what else? Right now, focus scientists focus of this year at least on somehow shifted to synalytics and stem cells. I think it will remain there for a few years. So maybe in in year two years we will see pendulum will bounce back to another direction and extracellular metrics because it's not really something new. It's the first 
I still remember the first, first paper about effect of, of extra telematics on longevity dated by back 40s, 1940s or something like that. So it's uh, 80 years old theory. So I hope in next years we will see some changes and more research will be conducted on extra telematics and its role on longevity and aging. I, I, I can't really think of any other questions. It was addressed, Aubrey mentioned um, that we only may need to address like, you know, 50%, like one type of extracellular matrix might take 50%. Yeah, he's, of, he's, of he said about, yes, as he mentioned, uh, he, uh, it was glucosepen, he mentioned, because it's the most abundant in human tissue. However, think about this, glucosepen, once you remove it from the system, we don't know how to, right? We can apply, for example, we can use catalytic um, antibodies, uh, it's enzymes to remove it. But this vacant place, how long it will remain vacant? If there is other 20 or 19 or other, like some molecules waiting for this vacant place, we will immediately patch it. So in this case, we need to continuously doing something, undoing, undoing metrics. So continuously, in this case, we might see results. We might see changes in mechanical properties and structural properties. Otherwise, you remove it, and next hero will patch it, like patch this hole. Uh, this is the reason I'm quite skeptical about um, efficacy of therapy, which targeted only one type of um, crosslink glucosepine, and some animals. Uh, okay, it's like probably it's another story, but uh, I, I was uh, I was thinking to say about there's some study shows correlation between lipid composition, membrane lipid composition, and lifespan. And as we know, glu during the cross-linking, not only sugars, not only glucose involved in this process, also uh, lipid peroxidation, lipid peroxidation plays some role, like maybe half, half of this cross links they happen not, on, not, not, on, not because of uh, glucose, also because of lipids. So, and we can see from studies, animals with uh, more resistant oxidation, with lipids, more resistant to oxidation, they're prone to have longer lifespan. So maybe we can adopt another approach. Instead of just trying to break down cross-linked molecules, we can prevent cross link accumulation. But as I said, there's two two players, glucose and uh, lipids peroxidation. Glucose we cannot remove from our system, so it's like it's uh, in very narrow concentration, and uh, we, what we can do just avoid like some uh, pathological concentration, like in some conditions like diabetes. But how to deal with uh, lipid peroxidation? How we can slow it down? Like probably you might think about uh, antioxidants. However. Lipid peroxidation happening not because of um, it's happening because of protons leaking out mitochondria and anti antioxidants are not effective to deal with protons. What effective is and today we will hear the presentation of um, Michael, uh, Mike Shipilov from Retrotrop. What effective is to slow down or uh, uh, alter this. Uh, proton leakage from mitochondria, it's replacement. Replacement of polyunsaturated fats by deuterium modified versions of them. So what does it mean? Deuterium, it's a isotope of hydrogen, has bigger, much bigger molecules, and it's prone to, it's more tidy linked to the main molecules of uh, polyunsaturated fats. In this case, to detach this hydrogen, uh, detachment required more energy. And this type of modified polyunsaturated fats, they are more prone, to, uh, prone to, uh, to be stable, they are less prone to be oxidized. In this case, replacement, dietary replacement of polyunsaturated fats by modified version of them might help us to reduce, maybe, maybe, might help reduce the uh, process of cross-linking and might slow down aging process. So it is an open topic, open discussion, it's just an idea, but uh, I think the interesting one and which can be tested relatively like in a few years relatively quick okay thank you so much.